So when it comes to bones, we have a bunch of uh, different categories that mostly work, and then we'll probably run into a few bones that don't neatly fit into these categories. But a good way of grouping different bones by shape and function is uh, on my screen right here. So we could think about flat bones as being kind of like this bone on the front of your skull, or maybe the shoulder blade is another good example. Uh, on the skull in particular, there's these little things called suture bones, which you don't really see too many other places in the body. You've got short bones, like those in the, the carpal bones in the wrist right here, or the um, tarsal bones of the foot. You've got long bones, like the femur, the tibia, radius and the ulna, the humerus. They all play a role either in, in helping people move in the world or manipulate objects. There's some mechanical advantages to having these bones be long and narrow, which we'll talk about in the future. Uh, there's irregular bones, which are maybe a catch-all category for the, the odd things that don't really fit into anything else. And then there's this interesting uh, little category of, of sesamoid bones, which really there's only, uh, there's only two uh, kinds of sesamoid bones in, in a normal person's body. There's the patella, which you know about, and then there's a, a little bone under the ball of your foot. It's much smaller than this, but uh, it's called the sesamoid bone. Um, or I think there's maybe a particular term for referring to the, the foot, but it's right underneath your, the ball of your foot, the first metatarsal head. Um, but what's interesting about sesamoid bones is that occasionally they can spontaneously appear in other places in the body. So for example, if you do a lot of manual labor with your hands, one place that sesamoid bones can appear is there's a tendon that kind of goes up uh, like this from the thumb. So the normal course of the tendon is like this. And if you do many months or years of, of manual labor, uh, sometimes what you'll find on an x-ray is a little sesamoid bone will just pop into existence there, um, probably to help with the mechanical demands of that task. And we'll talk in the future about exactly why the mechanical leverage from a sesamoid bone helps. But sesamoid bones are a useful little category just for that reason, but for most people, the only ones they have are the patella and then the sesamoid bones underneath the ball of your foot. Um, maybe you've seen those on anatomical models, maybe not. Um, here's the first metatarsal right here, and then here's the, the phalanges of the big toe. Um, those sesamoid bones sit underneath uh, right here like this, and most people have two. Occasionally, some people, uh, such as me, actually, have, th have uh, uh, three, so like this, this in inner one will be two separate, called bipartite sesamoids. Um, and those may or may not play a role in the development of some foot problems. But broadly, there's these categories of bones. They're useful to think about in terms of how those ty the type of the bone relates to its, its structural role. And we can also think about within a bone, what are the, what are the different areas of the bone and what are they doing? So here's an example of the femur. We've got the femoral head up here. Then down here, we're looking at the knee. There's a few different areas we can think about with the bone. We can think about the, it's called the epiphysis right here. That's uh, basically the ends. Epiphysis is the end. And then in the middle, you've got the diaphysis. This all applies, by the way, to long bones in particular. So the diaphysis is the long, narrow, skinny part in the middle of the bone. Then the epiphysis is, is the end where it, uh, it attaches to the other, uh, to the joints, whatever joints it's, it's plugged into. We've got another epiphysis down on this end, and you'll notice here's the distal end. It's called the distal epiphysis. Here's the proximal end. It's called the proximal epiphysis. Hence the importance of knowing those terms from the last exam. There's also occasionally you run into this term, the, the metaphysis here and here. It's sort of like in between. Um, not always clear where that uh, begins and ends relative to the epiphysis. But in any case, the roles of these 
two categories, the epiphysis and diaphysis in long bones, are as follows. Number one, the epiphysis is mostly constituted by this, it's called spongy bone, or uh, sometimes also uh, called trabecular. So let me write that down. Trabecular, aka spongy, as in a sponge. So that's here and also down here. And then in the middle, you've got this. It's called compact bone. Sometimes also called cortical bone. And this bone is, is stronger, and it has to be stronger because the cross-sectional area down here is much smaller than up here. So from a mechanics standpoint, you need a stronger material down here to be able to handle those loads. It also turns out that this area in the middle of the bone, the diaphysis, is particularly vulnerable to bending. So if you take a stick and you try and bend it, um, it usually breaks in the middle. And that has to do with the mechanics of how the bending stresses distribute inside the bone. So having compact bone in the middle, this stronger cortical bone helps prevent damage from bending stresses in the bone. Uh, trabecular and spongy bone is spongy because it's a useful place to put your bone marrow. So there's a lot more uh, bone marrow, which perhaps, as you know, is where our body makes uh, blood cells. So there is still some of it in compact bone. It's in the middle. But bone marrow, um, more plentiful up here. It's maybe useful to point out uh, that there is a, an advantage to the way bones are structured in the middle. So imagine we took like a little, little transverse plane slice here, and we would see you know, the, the cortical bone like this, and you've got some bone marrow in the middle here. Um, you are able to get a, quite a strong bone even by having a relatively thin layer of cortical bone, and that has to do with the, um, the physics of how structural beams like this resist bending, or compression for that matter. A good analogy is maybe a, a cardboard tube from a paper towel roll, or maybe a soda can. Even though it's very, there's relatively little material, it turns out that, that the material on the outside, like this, is quite strong. It's much more able to resist compression and bending than if you had material in here. So this is a very efficient way to organize a given amount of bone mass is by putting it this in this um, in this sort of uh, like perimeter orientation. And it turns out that when, say, you start doing more physical activity and your bones get stronger, a lot of the bone growth happens on the outside right here. The bone gets a little bit bigger, and it turns out that that marginal gain in bone size, bone cross-sectional area, is much better in terms of conferring strength than if you had added bone in the middle here. So one thing that I just want to point out now and that we'll come back to later is, and in fact that we'll go on to talk about it in the next video, is exactly how this process of remodeling happens. We're very lucky that bone is a self-healing material and that if you induce some damage in it, it will not only heal the damage, but it will actually get stronger in response. So we'll talk about how that happens in the next video.